everyone. Welcome to the 277th episode of the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Toffel. And we have a fun show for you today. We're going to be talking about Google's house mouse, a little update on the Fitbit acquisition. We're going to move over to Amazon to talk about next week's event, a little bit of discussion about what Amazon does without a phone. And their site-wise industrial IoT platform is now generally available. So we'll talk about what that is and what that means. The UK is launching a new law for smart home devices, and we really think it's a positive first step. Microsoft and Samsung are partnering on real estate tech. Arm might be for sale or IPO or we don't know. Zoom has a new device for your home, and there is yet another option out there for people who want to have a smart speaker but don't want it listening in. Plus, you're going to hear from our advertiser, Very. And this week, our guest is John Cobb, the CEO of Ayla, and he's going to be talking about both the technical and the process realities of bringing people back to work post-COVID. So you're going to want to stay tuned for that. And now let's hear from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Very. Are you looking for an IoT development team who's been there, done that? Very's award-winning, full-service IoT development firm will work with you to deliver your IoT solution on time and on budget. Learn more at www.verypossible.com. That's www.veripossible.com. Okay, Kevin, let's talk about the house mouse. The house mouse? What's a house so mouse? <laughs> I know. So this came out in a fast company profile of Google's Dan Kaufman, who is in charge of the ATAP. ATAP is Google's Advanced Technology and Projects Group. Basically, it's all the crazy stuff that you're like, what? You're going to stick computers and fabrics? Oh, now we have Project Jacquard. Or what? You're going to make a crazy small chip for ultra wideband? Now we have Soli. So there's several projects mentioned in this article, and it's it's a long but good article on ATAP. But House Mouse sounds like a lot of fun. And it is a remote control device that you can use to add more intent, basically more context to what you mean when trying to control a smart home. So if I'm pointing this control at a lamp, I can turn on the lamp, right? I can say turn on the lamp and it knows exactly or just turn on and it will know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It also, they showed things like using Google Lens in this device to take a picture of like a CD cover. I don't know who still has CDs, but if you do, you can take a picture of it and then move it over to a speaker and it'll start playing on that speaker. It's kind of fun. And it gets to that age old problem of if everything in your house is smart, how are you going to know without naming everything, something highly specific, how is it going to know what you want it to do? Like that you're talking to that particular device. Right. It's it's a context thing uh, at that point, which is sorely needed. I mean, we, we can say, hey, G lights on. And if you preset a group of lights in that particular room where that speaker is, then they will go on. But what if you only want one of those lights? You have to remember the name. And that's not ideal. There's another opportunity here. It's not mentioned in this article, but I have something in mind. Tell me more. All right. What if each person in the house had their own house mouse? Now you can do presence detection as well. Nope. Nope. I do oh. not want to walk around with a physical remote and your phone. Okay. I get where you're going with this, but I think each room should have a house mouse. All I'm right. sorry. All and I right. think the house mouse should talk to whatever BLE device is on you. And it should be like, yo, this person is Stacy because she's wearing a Fitbit. I'm all for that. Know. I'm all for that. I'm just, I still don't know why we're not using phones for that kind of thing, but. Because not everybody has a phone on them all the time, Kevin. I know, but. Hello. So, okay. So use the Fitbit. That's <laughs> fine. That's fine. That's fine. Hey, I've got a great segue here. Yeah. Speaking of Fitbit and Google, Google has promised regulators. I don't know if you, people are, I keep seeing that this deal that Google announced that they were going to buy Fitbit last year. And when they made that announcement, it was a big deal. But every time I see people talking about it, they say that like it's a done deal, like mm -mm. acquisition of Fitbit. And it's mm -mm. not a done deal. No. I keep checking on this like 
every time I read it in like mainstream media, I'm like, wait, did that deal finally close? It's a proposed acquisition. Yeah, so it hasn't. And Google's getting some pushback in Brussels, the EU, how they love their, <laughs> they love these, these privacy deals. Go EU. Google has said that they are not going to use data, health data from Fitbit to target ads because the EU has some antitrust concerns about the deal. I wasn't thinking that Google was going to use the data from those devices for ad targeting anyway. So I feel like this is kind of like Google saying, uh, yeah, we won't be super questionably evil. Um, so let's just let us have this deal. Right. I, yeah, I'm with you. I never thought this was about data for ads. I thought this was about building up a data set for health research and better health products. Yeah. And to give Google a credible competition, a credible competitor to the Apple Watch, which, you know, basically puts yeah. Google's assistant, Google's, yeah, Google assistant in more places. So that's what I thought this was yeah, about. Yeah. Cause, cause as it stands today, Google fit ain't all that. Mm. Or Android Wear. What? What are all these things? Right. I don't even, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, Google said in an emailed statement, this deal is about devices, not data. And we appreciate the opportunity to work with the European Commission on an approach that safeguards consumers' expectations that Fitbit device data won't be used for advertising. Okay, fine. So we'll see. So that's the latest update on that deal, which is it is not done. And that's all I have. <laughs> so let's talk about Amazon because Amazon has a bunch of things going on. Starting with Amazon is hosting a developer event next Wednesday on July 22nd. And both Kevin and I are signed up for this. And I was hoping this was going to be more of a device launch kind of thing. I don't think so for, for a couple of reasons. I mean, one, they've traditionally gone in the third, fourth quarter for these kinds of device announcements for the home. I don't think they've ever changed that. That's pretty much been the norm. Uh, that well, they've only done it for two years, I think, or maybe three. Well, but even yes. the, the original Echo came out in November of 2014. <gasps> You're right. Yeah. So, and also typically, but not always, there are usually some either FCC certifications that people see for Amazon devices you know, a week or two before events, product launches. So, and I haven't seen any of that. I don't think so. And, and plus, when you look at the agenda, there's only a 45 minute spot for opening remarks and keynote. And the, the next three hours and 15 minutes are pretty much developer oriented things. Okay, Kevin, you're probably right. And this is disappointing. On a developer side, maybe we'll hear more nothing burger about chip because <laughs> we've now had Google no talk to developers about chip. Apple said, Chip, we're on board. So we can, we can look forward to not hearing much about chip or maybe Amazon is the person who will be able to like blow the whole thing wide open. I'm hopeful. Maybe they'll talk about things like getting under local control, which is, it's very different from Google and Apple. I don't know. Rest assured next week's show, you're going to hear all about it. Speaking of places that Amazon is a little bit different than Google and Apple. There's one big thing, and we've mentioned it last week after Google's event, but Kevin took a deeper dive on this topic, which is Amazon doesn't have a phone. And what does that mean for the company? Yeah. And like you said, we mentioned this last week when we discussed the Amazon Echo Frames that I had reviewed, and I was kind of like, meh, they're just not doing it for me. And you also reviewed the Echo Auto product, which didn't do it for you, but that was partially because of the Bluetooth connection issues that you had yeah, with that. Yeah, that was just frustrating. Yeah, but as I mentioned last week and then took a deeper dive this week in a blog post, Amazon's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. In the home, you could go with Siri, Google Assistant, or Madam A and be happy because there are many speaker options or TV set-top box options, et cetera, or screens, whatever. Once you leave the home, though, you kind of leave Madam A behind because she's not baked into any phone. There was, there was the Fire Phone back in 2014, but that was kind of weird because it didn't have Madam A. And that's because the phone came out before the first Echo and the Madam A service. So that was, that thing tanked. I mean, Amazon took a $170 million write down to the Fire Phone. They couldn't give them away at 99 cents in the final weeks of offering it. And that was just a just bad timing because if that had succeeded, Madam A would be more 
prevalent outside the home. She would still live on your phone, but she'd always be listening potentially. Instead, you're stuck with, if you're using an iPhone, with Siri always listening, or if you have an Android, it's typically Google Assistant. So that's, as I said last week, that's why we've seen device after device after device from Amazon to get Madam A available to you when you're outside of the house. And that just hasn't worked. There's some car makers that now put Madame A in the car. That's helpful. I don't think the Echo Frames are going to be a big seller at $250. All these require your phone anyway. Yeah, I'm with you. So we'll see if maybe somehow they can jujitsu and turn this disadvantage into an advantage at some point. But for now, it does feel like they're missing a big piece of the ecosystem. That's not stopping them, though, from putting putting smarts in more things. <laughs> big news. Big news? No. But fun news for people who are interested in not waiting in line at the grocery store. Amazon has launched a shopping cart, a smart cart, that is not like one of those airport smart carts where you pay a lot of money for a <laughs> cart for your luggage for those extra few feet. This is a device with a camera. It has computing, it has an internet connection, and what it does is when you pick things down from shelves, it registers what they are and charges you for them, and then you can walk out. This is a more portable way to do the Amazon Go store experience. I was interested in this because I had been reading about alternatives to this in like other countries. So there are stores, and I can't think of where they are. We'll just go with in other countries where they have created like sections where you can have an Amazon Go like setup for like items that people typically buy. So like milk and bread and I don't know, canned lentils and right now toilet paper. So all of that's in there. And so for people who just want to run in and run out, they can have that Go like experience. But for the big weekly shop, they probably will not. And this is far more portable. Yeah. And, and I know it's really meant for like, Amazon supermarkets, Amazon Go stores. But don't forget, a few shows back, we talked about Amazon actually like licensing out its uh, supermarket technology so that others can use this. So I, it may go beyond the, the Go stores. He's like, there's no Go stores near me. So I, I'm like, I don't care what they're doing with the Go store. But if the local giant by me adopts this technology, I'm like, oh, this would be cool. And I, some other time, not today, we have to talk about QR codes because you sign in to the cart with a QR code. And that's a story for another time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. I know. We've, yeah, oh, off, we, offline. We've we've so, mm -hmm. Yeah, we're obsessed with QR codes here. All right, next week. Oh, also next week, we'll do a teaser for next week. QR codes and Kevin. Oh, the wise came outdoor. Because our review unit just arrived right before the show. So I haven't even unboxed it yet. But yes, that will, we'll talk about that next week. Yay. Okay. Let's move to the world of regulation. The UK has a new law that's being proposed to make smart products a little bit more secure. So these proposals are drawn up by the Department for Digital, Culture, Media, and Sport. And they are also supported by the National Cybersecurity Center. And this is how the UK government plans to improve security for smart products sold in the UK. And there are three main points, and I think I have written about this before, but I'm just going to tell you about them if you're not aware. It's that device passports must be unique and not resettable to any universal factory settings. That's pretty common. We actually have some laws like that in California. Manufacturers must provide a public point of contact so anyone can report a vulnerability. I like that. I would love to see a little bit more like, and we will not sue you. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, and this is my favorite, information stating the minimum length of time for which the device will receive security updates must be provided to customers. Yay. That's an expiration date, y'all. This is great. It is. I was curious if potential customers would know the date before purchasing. And further down the actual press release, there is mention of that sort of. It says, shoppers are urged to look at the information on the duration of security update periods when choosing a smart product. So that may just mean look up the product online, but I would love it if it was like actually on the box before you bought it. You shouldn't, my point is you shouldn't have to buy the product to find out later how long it will be supported. 
Exactly. That's like buying so, milk and then getting home and opening up the package and the inspiration date is on the inside of the cap or something, you know? Ooh, yeah, that would be terrible. Yeah. So they're announcing, they're publishing their proposals, and what will happen is they're going to call for comments. And what they're trying to do there is figure out the scope of the rules, what the industry needs to do to comply with those, and figure out how to enforce them. So on the enforcement side, they, they're talking about like possibly being able to ban the product while testing for these things, permanently banning insecure products, or forcing a recall. And then some of these also include fines. So this has some teeth. So I am excited. Obviously, I'd like to see more, but I'd always like to see more. That's kind of how regulation works, right? <laughs> Everything really stringent does get watered down a little bit, but I like this. I would love to see something like this at the national level. We have seen proposals at the U.S. national level, but those have been based on government, like things that the government buys. Which is a good step, but it's not really, uh, it doesn't really protect normal people as well. Cause the government is probably not buying a bunch of smart plugs. I could be wrong. <laughs> plug Shame. in that fax machine to the smart plug there. Yeah. I'm like, oof. Oof. okay. So that's the regulatory front. Let's talk about some industrial news. Microsoft and Samsung have partnered on real estate tech. And this is like the third such partnership that we've we've seen. Honeywell and SAP announced a partnership where they would share data and help companies assess the value, the economic performance of their buildings. I'm pretty sure Siemens and Salesforce also did a similar partnership also last month. So we're seeing a lot happen here. And with Microsoft and Samsung, this is a little little strange because they're going to pair Samsung's smart home appliances and devices with Microsoft's Azure cloud technology. I am so glad you said that because I was I was waiting to say I find this strange <laughs> because I thought Samsung was kind of doing their own thing. I mean, they have Arctic and the Samsung IoT cloud. Oh, no, they killed Arctic. Okay, they killed the Arctic cloud a while back. They killed it and had something else. I thought take its place. I could be wrong. I mean. I thought they were doing their own thing. And now all of a sudden, they're partnering with Microsoft for Azure Digital Twins Tech and Dynamics 365 Field Service and using Azure IoT. So is that it? Samsung pulling the plug on its own managed services for its own devices? I think it pulled most of those a while back. Hmm. What I think is weird is they've been pushing this news and I got the press release and they were like all about the real estate industry, but this really just sounds like using Samsung's, it's basically tying Samsung's smart home stuff to Azure cloud. Right. And I don't understand, well, I can see a use case for Azure digital twins in my home for managing things, but my hunch is Samsung will probably use that to make assessments about their devices in the huge undertaking. So that would be very cool, but yeah, and and there is there is mention of it says Samsung plans to offer smart things mobile development tools to enable builders to craft custom tailored connected living experiences for their end users. So that'll go beyond the smart TVs, the, the HVAC system, etc., to refrigerators, washing machines, vacuums, ovens, etc. Hmm. Yeah, and and they're talking about the property industry as well. So this could be like apartment owners, that sort of thing. Right. The other partnerships I mentioned are much more tied to the office world. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that this is not still related. Like those were kind of COVID-19 related. Like they were like, oh, we've always wanted to get together and real estate becomes a natural source for that because of people needing to keep track of people and all the technology that people are deploying in their offices for safety in a post-COVID world. They talk about HVAC systems and smart TVs integrated with smart things. I mean, yeah, so sure. <laughs> Uh, I'm like, yeah, it's, it, they're basically creating a portal for Samsung to manage the devices and also for people who like apartment owners to manage these devices. So that could be useful. Like if you saw that your Samsung dishwashers in your apartment building were leaking, you know, that's good yeah. to know. I wonder if any like third party integrators will now have more access to come in and do custom smart homes. And instead of using the typical high end platform and devices, they say, Hey, we also offer smart things. And that could be cool. Yeah. 
Also, Microsoft did a partnership with Lando Lakes, and I'm going to write more about this in the newsletter because I love butter. butter. And also, I love ag tech. And I think this is interesting. So they are doing a multi-year strategic alliance that will use Azure and various Azure services to help Lando Lakes improve their dairy farming initiatives. And I also learned about a service called Azure Farm Beats, which is a machine learning and AI tools that is actually pretty cool. There's lots of stuff in there, like on looking at satellite imagery to assess the health of fields. You said Farm Beats. I was thinking of headphones, smart headphones for uh, people on tractors, but I guess not. It's not. And nor, nor is it, and I'm very disappointed at this, Farm Beats, like the vegetable beets. It is B-E-A-T-S as yeah, opposed to B-E-E-T-S. Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> such, such a waste. And they're also partnering. Microsoft has a rural broadband effort, uses the white spaces broadband that I think I last wrote about in 2010, 2008. Eesh. Yeah, so long ago. I was very excited about it at the time. It didn't go very far. But Microsoft's using it for rural Wi-Fi. And Land Lakes is going to work with Microsoft for rural Wi-Fi. No expiration date do- on uh, on licensed spectrum. So Yeah. And if you're going to do ag tech, a lot of that is in areas of the country where there isn't great broadband. So it makes sense. Okay. So that's, is that all I have on Microsoft? Yeah. Yes. Speaking of making sense, does this make sense? Now ARM may be for sale or it may go public? Yeah. What's going so- on? Yeah. So last week, Arm said it would spin out two of its IoT services business. And we explained why that was happening. It made sense. Now SoftBank is saying, well, the Wall Street Journal reported that SoftBank has hired bankers to basically explore strategic options, which basically means we would like to make money on this sooner rather than later. Does anyone want to buy it? What should we do? And so, I mean, Arm makes sense as a public company. Sure. Does it make sense to be sold? But no, because first of all, I worry about who could buy it. And I don't know if regulators would allow this, but perfect example, you couldn't let Apple buy it. Right. And well, Apple actually started, was one of the founders. Yeah, they were investors. Yeah. Yes, yes. But SoftBank bought Arm in 2016 for $32 billion. Yeah. And I actually... I mean, that's a lot. That was, and I don't know if they could recoup that. And SoftBank really does want to recoup its, they need to free up some cash basically from their vision fund because everything happening right now. So with Arm, with this dude, I, I mean, like. I just don't know who would buy it. I mean, it has licensees, so you you wouldn't let a licensee to buy it unless they were required to continue licensing out to others. So who would buy it? I mean. Intel. <laughs> well. <laughs> Intel's already killed one arm at Actually, I think it's killed multiple ARM acquisitions, at least at least one. They bought a company that could have gotten into the, the ARM space a yeah. long time ago, like well, when I was in my early 20s. The, they sold off the, uh, uh, what was it, strong ARM processors with Xscale or whatever it was. Yeah, back it was in- Xscale. That was, yeah. that was their deal. And they just were like, eh, we don't like this. That was just before smartphones needed ARM yeah. chips. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Intel has a history of like just indiscriminately buying random stuff because it's like, yeah, okay. And then selling yeah. it at the wrong time. Yes. Not just selling it, just <laughs> not doing what Languishing. it should do with it. Mm-hmm. So if ARM's going to do anything, I think it should go public. Yes. It feels like the challenge with the Internet of Things. So on the smartphone side, it's chips. It sells licenses, not chips, right? Correct. So yeah, the architecture licenses for its smartphone chips and its server chips and all of this very like high every chip that sells they they do well with on the microprocessor like the iot side they do less well just because it's a dumber cheaper processor that it's going into that the architecture is going into so is there an opportunity to make it up on volume maybe what i'm looking for is arm to really differentiate itself with the ai space but there's a ton of competition in this space. So I think that there is an opportunity for ARM to like boost ASPs, even average selling prices, even on cheaper chips, basically based on having very good AI functionality as part of that. But there's a lot of competition there. So we'll see. Anyway, that's the ARM news. Another weird news that I'm questioning, 
Would you spend $599 on a Zoom device? No, I would not, but Zoom must think people will because they announced this week the Zoom for Home, which includes a 27-inch screen, three wide-angle cameras, eight microphones, and that display is a touchscreen. It's actually being produced by D10, D-T-E-N, partner company, Five ninety nine available for, for pre-order now, and I don't know why you need a dedicated Zoom device. I don't either, but the Facebook portal was doing well for a while, so maybe that's what Zoom's going for here? I don't know. Uh, well, maybe. I love talking to my family on Google's displays. Sure, right? sure. But they do more. Than yeah, just and that. Six hundred dollars is a lot. Right, Zoom. Any any screen in your house that has compute practically that runs a modern operating system can run Zoom. Yeah. Now I have had a lot of people who are like, "How can I hack my you know Google Display to take my Zoom calls?" So that's a thing. I guess people just want it on an external monitor because it's like I'd say, "Why are you doing that? You have don't you have a computer?" But maybe they want to use the computer for documentation and other things. I, I don't know. Documentation. I think they probably Ew. just don't spend time on the computer. Mm. Hey, I forgot a story that we meant to cover in the Amazon business. So we're going to scoot back to that for just one second. Sure. I promised you I'd tell you about Amazon, AWS, Amazon Web Services. They made SiteWise, which is an IoT monitoring service. It's been around since like 2018, but now it's generally available. So it's out of beta. This is a platform that anyone in the industrial IoT is going to want to pay attention to in the sense that it lets you pull in all of your data from your industrial equipment and you can organize it and monitor it and all of that stuff can happen in AWS. People use this. They like it, but I'm going to tell you there's a big caveat here, which is if you're going to use something like this, Amazon is going to charge you for your messaging, your data storage, sending the data to the cloud, data processing, and site-wise. So Yeesh. you really need to evaluate, do you want to pay? And it's a great way to get super locked into Amazon. Mm -hmm. If you're already locked into Amazon, then this probably makes a lot of sense. But just be aware that this, yeah. this is all about like tying you ever closer Telemetry Amazon. data is telemetry data. I'd say don't get locked in, but that's just me. Yeah. Well, you're not running a multi, multi-million node nah. <laughs> analytics operation. <laughs> I got no time for that. Okay. So moving right back into another little news bit. Oh, this ties back to Amazon too. It does. There's another device out there. It's called Leaky Pick. It is a audio spy detector for your network connected devices and you can put this in your home or office, and it will detect the presence of devices that stream nearby audio to the internet. So basically, you could use this for cameras, you could use it for smart speakers, and it also tests for wake word false positives. So you'll know when your Amazon Echo or your Google activates when it shouldn't. It's an interesting approach on how they're doing it too, because apparently it's like, sending out small sounds and then checking network traffic to see if those sounds are going up to the cloud to either Amazon, Google, et cetera. So it's, then it says, Hey, you shouldn't have sent that. So you're listening. Stop listening. I feel like we shouldn't need this stuff because this, sort of, <laughs> no, we should have real transparency from the big players in the system. So to me, this is an interesting project, and this is just a project. It's a prototype. It uses a Raspberry Pi 3B, and it uses some other things like a headphone jack and an amplifier board and Wi-Fi looks, dongles. So It looks very DIY right now. It is. Yeah. Super DIY. Now, I don't see that it's available on GitHub. Well, I don't know. The cost is around $40, but maybe that's just the cost of the parts. Um, and you'd have to put it together. And If I find it on GitHub, I'm going to include a link. Otherwise, we'll include – right now, it's a paper, and they built one. So hopefully, it's it will become available for people who do want to build these things, because it is possible. If we had a fully functioning ecosystem and trust in our vendors, it feels like we wouldn't need these things. But here we are. That concludes the news portion of the show. Let's talk about our IoT podcast hotline, which is brought to you by Schlage. The best home automation adds convenience, not hassle. And with its built-in Wi-Fi, the Schlage Encode Smart Wi-Fi Deadbolt shows just how easy secure can be. 
You can learn more at schlage.com. So you'll be entered to win a Schlage lock if you call us before the month of July is over and leave us a message at 512-623-7424. And now let's hear this week's question. It's from Tony. Hi there. My name is Tony. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio area. My question is, I'm looking for smart plugs for my home. I've had some over the years, Casa and then some other brand that was from Amazon, and I have varied results. I'm looking for something. I have Hue lights. I have a Samsung smart thing. I'm looking for something that will work with all that, and IFTT. T, I think, and I am a Madam A household. I have a couple oscillating fans and stuff that I'd like to have controlled that way and some other things around the house. I would love to know your thoughts on what is a good smart plug out there currently. Thanks a lot. Okay, Tony. I have found only two things that might work for you based on must work with Madam A, must work with IFT, and must work with smart things. They are the Wemo plug. And I'm not sure what varied issues you had, but you might have varied issues with the Wemo smart plugs. I have occasionally experienced difficulty scheduling them. There was a known issue about scheduling things using Android phones. They fix that, but when they work, they work. If they, but sometimes they don't always work, which, yeah, great. So Wemo is one that works with all of those. The other is a smart things outlet. If you're going to do this, I recommend getting the, the skinny ones as opposed to the ones that take up the whole outlet plus the outlet underneath that outlet. Yeah, I don't tell you. <laughs> Yeah, we, I'm not sure what, what the issues or errors or problems were with the prior plugs. And I don't know if this, then that, or IFTTT requirement is specifically for. Obviously, you want to connect these plugs to some service to make something happen. And since you mentioned fans, I'm wondering if you want to have oscillating fans go on based on maybe the temperature in your house. And you don't have to do that with if this, then that. If you have a Madam A supported thermostat, you could do it natively, in which case I would actually recommend the unfortunately more expensive Amazon smart plug that is obviously going to work with, with Madam A. That's only if you're looking for that particular scenario. So again, I don't know what you want to use IFTTT for, but if it's that, maybe that's the way to go. Yeah. And I will tell you the Wemo mini smart plug, which is the one I'm going to recommend to you just because it's a little, it takes up less outlet space. That is $20 on Amazon. The smart things one is about 16 or $17. And the Amazon one is $25. Which is crazy. Yeah. So, all right. Well, those are your options there, Tony. I hope it helps. I actually like the TP-Link Casa outlets, but it sounds like you were using those and you had those various issues. So maybe you don't want to listen to me. I just wanted to confess that to you <laughs> in, in utter transparency. So that's that. Please, if you have a question for us, give us a call at 512-623-7424 and you will be entered to win a Schlage smart lock. All right, that concludes this portion of the show. Please stay tuned for our guest, John Cobb, the CEO of AILA, who is going to talk to us about using IoT to protect workers when you bring them back into the office and how that's not just a technical problem, but it's also a business process problem as well. And now a word from our sponsor. Hey, everyone, we are taking a quick break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Very, and I have Justin Schneck, who is a software engineering fellow at Very. Very is a fully distributed IoT engineering platform that partners with clients to build systems for smart manufacturing, smart energy and utilities, consumer electronics, and connected wellness. Justin is also the co-founder of NERVS, which is what we'll be talking about today. So, Justin, can you tell us what NERVS is and how it works in the real world? Sure. NERVS produces an open source platform and infrastructure for companies to build, deploy, and securely manage fleets of IoT devices at speed and scale. NERVS has two pieces. The NERVS platform, which allows you to build and deploy maintainable embedded systems, 
and Nurse Hub, which is an extensible web service that allows you to manage over-the-air firmware updates for devices in the field. NERVS has different use cases across industries. For example, Latote, the clothing rental service, uses NERVS to build web-based kiosk systems to drive warehouse productivity. Meanwhile, FarmBot is an open-source farming project that uses NERVS to manage fleets of smart farming devices. Oh, I love FarmBot. So what got you interested in IoT development? At one time, I wondered how hard it would be to start my motorcycle from my phone. What I found was rewiring the motorcycle and writing the interface was the easy part, but connecting it all together proved to be a challenge. I wanted something to make that easier. So I teamed up with my co-founder, Frank Hunleth, and with the help of the open source community, we started building NERVS. Awesome. So how does NERVS connect to the work you're doing with Very today? Well, NERVS is Very's choice for embedded development because it offers agility, security, adaptability, and scalability. NERVS also uses the Erlang runtime system, which is known for being distributed, fault tolerant, soft real time, and highly available. Very has used NERVS on projects like an IoT beer kiosk that our team built for Hop. And we continue to use it in most of our ongoing IoT projects. Part of my job is to add my expertise to those projects, and the other part is to continue expanding the capabilities of the NERVS platform to make embedded development easier. Excellent. So, Justin, where do I go to learn more about how Very can help me with my IoT project? You can reach out to us at verypossible.com slash Stacy. That's V-E-R-Y possible dot com slash S-P-A-C-E-Y. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Hagenbotham, and our guest today is John Cobb, the CEO of Ayla Networks. Hello, John. How are you today? Hey, Stacey. I'm doing really well. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. Excellent. Well, I'm excited because I've, wow, I followed Ayla for so many years since probably its founding, and it's been a wild ride for the IoT since like, I don't know, 20, 2012, 2013. And y'all have done a lot. So real briefly, why don't you orient people and tell them what it is Ayla does? Yeah, sure. So we're a an IoT platform company for mostly consumer device manufacturers. So so what does that mean? We we basically do everything that you need to do to to turn a non-connected product into a connected product. So if you have a vacuum and you want to turn it into a connected robot vacuum that people can control from from the road or from somewhere else in the house, we do all the stuff that helps that connection happen. Got it. So I know that you do mostly consumer, but I am very curious in the wake of COVID-19, we're seeing so many new IoT products adapted for business use and sensors and such going into offices. Are you seeing or doing any work on the enterprise side? Yeah, we absolutely are. So it's a really good point, actually. The you're right. Our, our background is, is mostly consumer and some commercial. And what we're seeing now is that there's just this additional uptick. This, you know, COVID is a forcing function, if you like. Uh, this additional uptick in enterprises looking at connected device solutions. You, you know, you'd, you'd expect to see some of that. But what we're seeing is companies saying, OK, I now need to, to turn my, my old office into a space where I can have people socially distanced, know that they're doing that. I've got to make sure that they're healthy and they're following all the rules we put in place. And we've got to, we've got to help them do that. And, and that's a, a business problem, number one, but a, but a technology problem, number two. And so a lot of the folks that we work with, with play with businesses anyway. And so they're now shifting that focus. Are those businesses prepared for, like you said, this is a, a business problem, number one, and a tech problem, number two. And I feel like a lot of companies are like, okay, we're going to put occupancy sensors, and we're going to have a robot that monitors your temperature. But they're not thinking about the actual business processes. So things like, hey, who's going to enforce all these rules? And what happens if someone isn't six feet apart and consistently doesn't stay that far apart? So what's your advice or maybe... I don't know, what are you guys thinking as you return to the office about combining business processes with the technology? It's, look, it's so true. And, and I mean, this is, this, by the way, is not a, it's not a COVID related problem, but right? it is, um, you know, absolutely when, when people adopt technologies for the first time, right, they're, they're really not prepared to do that. And IoT 
in general. I think that's very true for almost every one of our customers when they started on the journey to build an IoT product or adopt IoT technology. They made, and, and, and frankly, back in the early days, so did we, tons and tons and tons of mistakes. And you, you know, in the consumer world, you see that in terms of terrible mobile apps that were really expensive or devices that send gobs of data back to the cloud that, that has no value. In the enterprise world, it is exactly that. It's thinking through, well, I can absolutely put in a technology solution because, well, that's what everyone's doing and everyone's measuring their temperature. And so let's have a, a temperature sensor on the door. And then you've got the problem to say, well, okay, who's managing that? What happens when there is a problem? Where does that data go? How is it secured? Am I infringing on someone's privacy? What other pieces of data do I need to back that up with? And in our experience, people aren't really thinking through that right now. And so what we're actually seeing is the companies that can afford to keep people uh, away are doing that. And the companies that aren't are using really, really manual processes still because they're starting to run up against some of these barriers. Got it. And are you guys keeping people away or are you bringing them back in? We, for the moment, are, are keeping them away. So we're in, in Northern California and, and in Bangalore. And in both places, you know, there's still a, a relatively high number of incidents. And, and we found that actually working from home has been very, very effective. We have built our plans on how we will go back to the office. Um, and as you'd expect, there's a fair amount of technology in that. But for us, as for everyone else, the, the conversations have been around, well, what are our enforcement policies? And we've had really interesting conversations around, well, if someone refuses to wear a mask in the office because they feel like it violates their rights, then does that person get to still be an employee of Ayla? Um, if we think the answer to that is no, then, then how do we handle that situation? And so those are the types of conversations that we're having. I also think that the security and privacy angle is really important. Obviously, that's something that we just we think every single day, but it's something that's really hard to do if you have a whole set of point solutions. Let's talk a little bit. Actually, I, I want to talk a little bit about that, but let's back it up just a little bit and help people maybe by coming up with a, a list of things they should be thinking about. If they're going to use COVID-19 as a reason to bring in more connected tech into their building, maybe what are the questions they should be asking themselves as they do that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the first question I'd be asking is, is what is my business goal? But we see so much tech adoption, it almost feels like it's for the sake of it. So we say, well, you know, what is the business goal? What are you trying to achieve? What is the right, the right outcome? So that, that would be the first question. Um, my second question would be then, what are the pieces of data? I wouldn't even think about the technology piece. I would say, what are the pieces of data that you need to achieve that business outcome? Then once you really understand that, think about what are the processes that you need if you had those pieces of data, what are the processes you need to put in place to you know, operationalize that data so that you got to the business outcome? And then I would start to think about, well, okay, how do I gather that data? And that necessarily will, will start to involve technology. And then the other thing that, that I think is really, really important, and, it, and, and for lots of reasons, you know, longevity of a solution, functioning solution, I would think about that solution not as a set of different pieces of, you know, potentially hardware that sit around the office that, you know, one's measuring your temperature and one's measuring occupancy and one's measuring distance and one's measuring some other some other kind of, you know, health metric or what's happening in the kitchen, for example, which is a, obviously a high risk area. I would be thinking about, is there a single platform or a single system that I can use to bring all of this together? Because I do think that as you think about achieving that business outcome, you're going to need multiple different types of data. Therefore, you'll need multiple different types of devices. And absolutely the situation you don't want to end up in is where you have five or six or 10 or 15 or 20 different vertical systems that are providing you those piece of different pieces of information. You have to think of it as a system problem. Or number one, it won't work. Number two, it won't scale. And number three, it'll become obsolete very quickly. I feel like that is the quintessential IT person's or IT perspective advice. And having covered and grown up in the IT world, I agree with you. I'm like, oh, don't build silos, build a horizontal platform and work from there. But for most businesses, small businesses especially, looking at doing something like this, they're like, I don't have the ability to evaluate a platform. I'm just going to buy whatever's out there. And 
maybe you have 20 apps for the time being. And it doesn't sound ideal, but I think that might be where we're going in, in some ways. So then I would wonder, what are the options to fix that two or three years down the road, if any? <laughs> Yeah, no, and that's another really good way to think about it, right? If you say, look, I am where I am today, I'm not going to spend the time to try and find one manufacturer that has 80% of what I need. I'm just going to buy these point solutions because, look, I've got a, a single campus or a single office or a single building or a single room that I'm that I'm dealing with, you know, then I then I think I think that's fine. And then say, okay, we will evolve as the industry evolves and as they make it easy. Look, I think this is a massive challenge in, in IoT, which is having lots of different products from lots of different companies work well together so that the, the consumer, whether that's a business or a man on the street, can really get value out of the full, um, out of the full ecosystem. That, that's always been a big challenge. Most of the big partners and companies that we work with today are working with us because they're, they're looking at doing very um, integrated, broad systems. So in, in our world, it's everything from safety and security and all of the devices you need for that, which, which overlaps very heavily with this conversation, but then all the way into the, you know, into the kitchen, into the garden, into the rest of the house. And they're looking at it in terms of, well, there are devices that we make that need to be part of this ecosystem. Then there are devices that other folks make that we need to work with this ecosystem. And then there are standards like you know, connected home over IP, like the CHIP initiative that we need to look at and, and make sure that we evolve with so that ultimately their customers will buy devices that work as piece of a part of an ecosystem. But I agree with you. I think I think it will be a journey and, and the scale of the problem that you're trying to solve should probably determine whether you say, okay, a bunch of point solutions are good enough right now, or no, we need to get this right and design something that's going to really last and evolve. I mean, everyone wants something that will last and evolve and be easy, but those are... Those are hard to come by. Let's let's kind of flip it a little bit on its head because your customers are actually the people making these devices. And so I would ask you, what is your advice to them? If, if you're sitting there or if one of your customers is coming to you and you're like, I think there's a great opportunity in, I don't know, occupancy sensing, what should they be thinking about as they seek to address this market and this opportunity? Yeah, it's interesting. So just on that point, I mean, in, in general, what, what we're seeing, because there is there's some of this, you know, there's definitely a change in the conversations we're having, but there's a lot of talk about the, the rush to digitalization caused by this. And what, what we're seeing is some IoT projects are accelerating, but in general, things are still going at about the same pace. Some of the data I saw recently said digitization is happening. There's about 20% of the folks who are engaged in that are, are now accelerating it because of COVID. I do think there's a, a general acceleration. I don't think it's as as rapid as some of you know some. Or it doesn't feel like it to us that it's as, as rapid as some of the numbers that I've that I've seen. And and I look, I keep coming back to this for our customers, and it's it's probably the key conversation that we have with with partners and customers, and we engage with them. And it is you know what is the business problem that you're trying to solve with the connected product? Once you really understand what that business problem is, you can then get into the you know, specific advice about, okay, this is this is the way to think about it. Is it an integrated solution? Is it a is it a vertically integrated solution? Is it something that has to be part of an ecosystem? You know, are you going after end consumers versus, you know, restaurants is an in interesting one because it's it's an area that we play in quite a lot. You know, connecting devices inside um, uh, inside restaurants. And um, I went and ate at a restaurant a Sunday night outdoors, and it was interesting. They had a, a thermometer there, not connected. We had to write down our temperature. Once they took our temperature, we wrote it down, we signed it. And then everyone was, I'd say, very well behaved. You know, the, the, the waiters and waitresses had gloves on. Um, they had masks on. Everything, everything looked relatively, relatively well controlled. But what was my brain, of course, went straight to you. Well, what would you do in terms of contact tracing inside a restaurant like this? So you have probably some idea that I've been there because I, I wrote my name down. You know, do you know which table I sat at? I don't think so. Do you know who my waiter or waitress was? You know, I don't think so. Do you know what we had to eat? You know, was there risk there? And so my brain went straight away to, okay, today you have a, you know, a single thermometer, uh, you know, a laser thermometer. We write down, we use paper, in, you know, to determine that it was, it was me and my temperature. There's no ID check or anything like that. And my brain went to the point, well, wouldn't it be great for restaurants to have a, 
an integrated solution that not only stored maybe my driver's, you know, scan of my driver's license plus my temperature plus what table I sat at plus who my waiter was, and you could then get into real contact tracing for me to do it. So um, anyway, it's a very long-winded way of saying my advice is be really, really, really clear about you know the business problem that you're trying to solve as you're playing in the in this digitization that's occurring right now. Because I do think there's going to be a whole lot of panic buying. Got it. I I feel like I've been doing some panic buying and not just of toilet paper. I am with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> and and with that. In mind, how much of this technology that people are adopting today, how much do you think they'll be using three years from now or maybe even five years from now? My look, and unfortunately, I think I'm going to come back to my, my IT centric view. And it's unfortunately my background. So I'm, I'm a little hampered by, by the shape of my brain. My view is that there will be, there's going to be a bunch of stuff that's brought now that is just frankly, a bit more of a gimmick. It's probably not that useful. It's not going to help you that much. You hear about kind of apps that make sure that you're washing your hands for long enough. Things like that, to me anyway, don't feel terribly useful. I don't think they're going to be terribly long-lived. You then have things like consumer automatic soap dispensers. I actually think they're a pretty good idea, but in a year's time, if that one breaks, are you just going to pick up a bar of soap or are you going to go buy another one? Are you going to go get that refill for that soap? Or are you, you know, I, my personal view is there'll be a, a pretty big drop. It's not quite gimmicky, but it feels on the edge of it to me. And then you've got, I think, single standalone solutions that that probably work really well for what they do. And I think I think they will last. They'll probably last that 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 three year time frame. But but ultimately, and and I know I keep coming back to it, and I can't help it. It's just the way where my brain works, and and just seeing what our customers are asking for and Seeing what the big, you know, the, the big customers ours are doing now, they're all talking about big integrated solutions with lots of different types of devices to really solve whatever the problem is they're trying to solve. And I think for me, I think that is the answer. You know, if you're building products that can work as part of an ecosystem or are designed right out of the box to be part of that ecosystem and fulfill an important need in it, then I think those are going to last and last and last and last. I just, as you kind of said before, unfortunately. You know, they don't really exist today. Uh, the ecosystems aren't, aren't fantastic, aren't, aren't terribly well defined. But I think that's where the opportunity is. Got it. I agree with you. But I am an IT person and I apparently have an IT shaped brain. <laughs> right. Okay. And now we should probably come back to this idea of privacy because I think a lot of people don't realize this, but anytime you connect something and you're gathering data from an environment, you're probably also gathering data on people, even if you don't necessarily intend it. And in some of these COVID cases, you absolutely intend it. How do you think employers should think about privacy when they're deploying these solutions? How are y'all thinking about it? For me personally, that is the question. And my short answer is, you know, how should you think about privacy when you deploy these solutions? You should think about it as the most important thing. I would say that you are better off having a non-functional solution then you are having a working solution that has poor privacy controls in place. Because the risk to your business is so great if you do that. And if you have a non-functioning solution, you're going to work out other ways to, to make it work. Whereas you may not know you have this huge privacy hole. So you're, you're right, right. Every time you connect a device, you create a security, a potential security hole and a potential. Every time you gather data, you create potential privacy issue. Look, the, the way that we think about it is basically every piece of data about a person, and that can be, you know, location, temperature, you know, where they're sitting, who they're talking to, all of that effectively is personal information. And so you, you have to think about, you know, the, the design of the system as you do that. You have to think about, well, it can't be possible except in, in very specific cases for anyone to be able to tie all of this information I have on this person to that individual. You know, you have to be able to keep a break there so that only in the case of, OK, we need to do contact. We need to work out who this person spoken to. Is there a, a very kind of um, controlled way of saying, right, all of this data refers to, you know, Jane Doe. And so things like blurring faces, if, you, if, you're, if you've got cameras and you're using cameras to make sure people stay uh, six feet apart, then blurring faces. And, and the other kind of, I mean, look, this is a really basic rule, but it's just worth stating is that if you don't have to collect a piece of data about someone, then don't collect it. And if you don't have to store it, then don't store it. And if you have to store it, store it for as short a period as possible. 
but my macro message is privacy is, is critical. And look, you can't have privacy without security. You can put in all the best privacy rules that you like and then have poor security and, you know, the privacy rules almost don't matter at that point. So, I mean, I could, I could literally talk for about five hours and all the things to consider here, but I, the most important thing is just, just consider it. <laughs> Just think about it, please. I will echo that. I spend a lot of time thinking about things like, you know, hand washing sensors in the bathroom. Do you need to know if someone didn't wash their hands? Right now, it feels like you might, but that is, that means you know when a person is in the bathroom, right? And you might even know how long they've been there. And then you're like, oh, I don't, no one should know that, right? Right. And that may be, look, but again, it may be okay if you then have an automated way of saying to that person, hey, you didn't wash your hand, or we, we don't understand that you wash your hands, as long as no one else can get at that data except through a very, very controlled HR-managed process, that may be okay, as long as everyone understands that that's, that's how this works. No, I, I'm picturing the comic strip where as you walk out of the restroom, the light blares, did not wash hands, did not wash hands. <laughs> So that would be possibly of nightmares. not optimal, uh, but I, I bet compliance would go up. All right. Well, John, thanks so much for coming on the show this week. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Stacey. I really appreciate it too. Thank you. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like more IoT news, sign up for my newsletter at stacyoniot.com. We'll see you next week. 